Awesome. Uh, so good morning and welcome to everyone joining us around the world. We are the .NET Docs show and uh, this is our fourth episode. Today we're joined by an amazing guest, Dina Barry. Good morning, Dina. How are you? Good morning. I'm doing well. What's it like on the West Coast in Washington right now? I think I want to dive into topics. COVID-19, is it scary out there? <laughs> I was actually wondering if you guys were going to cover this. I'm like, <laughs> we're having this uh, uh, Twitch stream and we're just going to pretend like nothing's happening. Um, <laughs> Uh, what is it like here? I think because I live in a pretty small town north of Redmond, but south of Vancouver, um, there's still this a sense that we're all going to like pretend like nothing's happening. School is closed, so it is weird to see um, grandparents and little kids and everybody just like walking or hiking or out with their dogs. It's like Christmas break, except it's not cold and awful. Um <laughs> But then it's like you can see people giving you like this sideways glance when you pass them. Like, right. should we step six feet away from each other? Or um, so, uh, yeah, it's a weird feel. And then work goes on. Like, I know people that can't work. The food bank here in town has closed. Oh wow! Uh, so you know, people who are are on the edge of you know paying their bills and and eating are having a very different experience than um people who can work remotely uh yeah definitely yeah it's it's the same here in the midwest like i know that the schools are closed now they actually said just recently schools are closed indefinitely um until the state of the emergency is lifted for wisconsin so that's kind of uh, it's terrifying. It's scary time. So hopefully this show um, can bring a bit of joy to those who are stuck, you know, hunkered down at home watching uh, with us. Um, so we have uh, LQ Dev one just asked the question. They said, can cognitive services predict COVID exposure? You know, I've actually seen some stuff internally about uh, people working on, uh, I'm turning on my chat. I know you can see my window, but I'm turning on. There, there's a lot of work going on internally, not necessarily exactly with cognitive services, but um, a lot of ML AI stuff going on internally, um, and even some open hacks going on to help with the uh, a wide variety of things. Prediction being one of them. Interesting. Cool. See, I can't see the chat messages. I don't. Am I doing this wrong? Uh, no, you're looking at the chat inside of Skype. We're looking at the chat live in the Twitch stream. Uh, okay. So don't worry about that. We can monitor the chat for you. Um, so did we want to start with some kind of introduction so folks know uh, oh, yeah. what Dina's working on and uh, what we were going to uh, hit on in this episode? Definitely. Are you guys looking at me to do that? I don't yeah. want to interrupt. I no, feel no, like yeah. There's a huge likelihood that I'm just going to interrupt you guys. No, no, no. You're good. You uh, this this show is dedicated to you. So hopefully, um, you feel oh, comfortable God. to speak up whenever. Uh, yeah. So let let the world know who you are and uh, what you do here at Microsoft. And I would also say that I interrupt Dave all the time, so don't feel yeah. bad if if that <laughs> happens. Okay. Um, well, in our org, we have been trying to um, be better about interrupting and be more inclusive in our, our discussions. So that, that's definitely top of mind here. So I am a content developer on Cognitive Services. This is the, the website for that documentation. I write for um, Q&A Maker, Language Understanding, and Personalizer. Um, this is sort of the, the text-based services over here. And then this is, we're calling it decision, but it's um, a little more uh, nebulous. It's not, it's not OCR, it's not text, it's not audio, it's not search. It's, it's more of a, uh, the other category, if there were other category. Um, and so uh, the, what, the, the service I want to talk about today is QA Maker. I think it might be actually most relevant to COVID. Um, 
easiest to get up and running, be most relevant to, to users, that kind of thing. So what um, is Q&A Maker? Like, what is Q&A? Is that like question and answer? It, is, it, it does stand for question and answer. And so the idea of Q&A Maker is that you have a set of content. Um, you can think of that as a website or PDF files or um, generally structured content that is like a document. So when I, when I mean structured like a document, I mean there's a heading and then there's text underneath and then maybe it has bullet points or maybe it has pictures. What I don't mean is content that is more X, Excel or access based. While it can bring that in, it's, it's more useful to content that you don't already have structured because it can apply that structure for you. Um, so here's a sort of a visual example is you, you have some sort of a chat bot and a customer will ask a question that your knowledge base or your some sort of content base can answer. You don't need a live person to answer that question. So, sure. Uh, actually, I'm gonna I'm gonna pop into a different um, I'm gonna pop into a different browser where I already have everything set up. So, um, hand is not maximizing. That's so awesome. Um, I wonder how I make that. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, this is um, this is a website. It's um, it should actually, other than that that lovely ID there, it should be available to everybody in. Power Virtual Agent, which I think is everybody inside of our um, AAD. So this might be a Microsoft internal thing. So it's an you can think of the Power Platform as available on Office 365. So if you have an Office 365 subscription, like my kid's school does, everybody inside of that school is inside of a virtual um, a grouping. And, and you can make a virtual agent inside of that, and that virtual agent will be available to everybody inside of your group, your school, your company, whatever it is, without having to set up any permissions. Once you, you create the thing and publish the thing, everybody inside of your organization automatically has permission to use it. So um, this particular chatbot, um, I can ask questions of it, and getting this guy running maybe took 20 minutes. I didn't have to do any programming. I did have to have access to the Azure portal, um, and I did have to have the uh, rights to create the Q&A Maker resource. Um, and so I think inside of an Office 365 environment, as a, that would probably be an IT person or maybe a school administration official, somebody like that. Um, so what I've done is I've used the Power Platform to connect it to a Q&A Maker that I already had built and published. So Q&A Maker, if you look at it, this is the Q&A Maker portal. Uh, something went wrong. Of course, something went wrong. I'm on the internet with a presentation. Something goes wrong. Okay. So I've already published my knowledge base with um, a PDF file that you can get, anybody can get, from the documentation. So at the bottom of each of our documentations, there's this nice link that says download PDF. And so what I've done is I've downloaded that PDF and I'm using it as the content of my knowledge base. And everything is super slow. Okay. Um, 
So I think this is where COVID-19 meets internet. I feel like everybody in the world is on the internet right now, and it's just everything is super slow. I thought you were implying like there's a virus on the internet (laughs) going around. (laughs) Uh, Okay. So if you, this is the Q&A Maker portal. Um, When you look at your settings for your portal, um, when you're first creating it, you're going to add some files and you can add a URL that's publicly available. So I actually did upload the the PDF and then I added something. Um, It says I added it as a file, but um, it was actually just a checkbox when I created my knowledge base to add chit chat and that handles conversational text like hello, goodbye, things that happen in a chatbot. So if we go and actually look at what that content looks like, those two files look like. So you can see I have the Q&A Maker PDF and I have a a tab separated file for the chit chat. So all I did was upload a PDF file and it pulled out this relationship between the pages. So this is a top level page and then these are subsequent pages that link to it. It pulled out a question that a customer might enter to get this answer, which has Markdown in it. And then the answer also has this relationship of child pages is also represented here. And so if you look at the what is Q&A Maker page, which is this page, you can see that there there's some um, subheadings in the page. There's images, there's a table. Um, There's not, there's some structure to the document, but in terms of having to change this into some sort of mappable path for a customer journey, you can see that Q&A Maker has done a lot of the work for you. It's created these other links and a customer can ask what it is. Um, so it started with this. When I imported the PDF, it started with this single question. And as I was playing with the knowledge base in the Power Virtual Agent, I noticed that, and it might even be up here. Nope. Oh, yeah, here it is. I say QA Maker question mark. And it answers me something that isn't, isn't very much information. It's not very helpful to a customer. And when I it's, went in... It's hard to see that, actually. Yeah, is it possible to squish the window a little bit? I, we can't see all of the, the chat bot on the right side. Yeah, it's off screen some re- for some reason. <coughs> we'll blame that on, on COVID. Can you see it now? <laughs> is, it, is it visible we, now? We see more of it, but there's still... A, 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 seems like a, a chunk of it's kind of sliced off. There, there we go. That's much better. Okay, so um, so I imported the PDF, mm-hmm. I saved it, I published it, I connected it to Power Virtual Agent, and then there's nothing else in the Power Virtual Agent. All it is is a connection to this Q&A maker. And the reason I did it is because Power Virtual Agent will get me this website quickly, like five minutes, 10 minutes, I have this website. Whereas if I was just using Q&A Maker, which is basically a REST endpoint, I would still have to develop this whole interface. And there's lots of ways to do it. There's bot framework from Microsoft, which will do that. Um, there is Power Virtual Agent, and bot framework is really for the developer, where Power Virtual Agent is more for somebody who doesn't have that developer experience, but still needs to connect the pieces. So um, so I asked the question, Q&A Maker, it should immediately answer from my knowledge base. There's no other data sources or connections in Power Virtual Agent. And what it did is it gave me an answer that wasn't very helpful. And so I went into my knowledge base and I looked at why it would pull that, I can't even remember which question it is. Um, 
But I looked at it, and I, what I really wanted was I wanted to return this top level one. And so I added additional questions with the question mark and without the question mark so that it would give me this, this answer. And you can see that the answer is formatted with um, Markdown. And so then I, I saved, that, saved those additional questions with Save and Train. I published again. I didn't have to do anything on the Power Virtual Agent side. It was already completely connected. Then I asked the question again, what is Q&A, or I say Q&A Maker, and now it's giving me more information. Wow, that's really cool. Um, that just made me like think, if we were to export the PDF for the entire docs.microsoft.com platform and <laughs> you know, post that up into Q&A Maker and actually make our search something that's usable, that'd be a really good win, wouldn't it? <laughs> it would. There's, so there's some caveats there. So one of the caveats is that you want your questions and answers um, easily manageable. So easily manageable means um, when you publish, these are basically units, right? So when we, when we change something on the doc side, every, every section has its own PDF. So there isn't any all-up cognitive service PDF, and there isn't any all-up Azure PDF. And the good thing about that is since you have to upload a file, if you uploaded a huge file, um, it would take forever just to get into Q&A Maker, and then Q&A Maker would have to parse the contents. So keeping everything at a small manageable bit is much better for both the management of the content and the um, a processing of the content. I but assume I, there's a size limitation for the file you can upload. Is that right? Uh, there probably is, but it's not something I know off the top yeah, of my head. If you don't know off the top of your head, that's fine. The other question I had was, what about uh, localization? So is this only U.S. English that could be supported uh, in this scenario? Um, you know, what if I had asked the same question, what is Q&A Maker in a different language, say Spanish? Um, how would one accomplish something like that? Ooh, so there, there's, there's a couple of questions there um a couple of um a couple of answers so there is language support and it's in here somewhere let's see languages um so there there is language support for a lot of different languages and and this really comes back to maintenance again if you are already maintaining your content store of information across those languages, it makes sense to have a knowledge base backed by each individual, a, a, a knowledge base per language set. And a knowledge base is only going to support one language. So you would have uh, all of these different knowledge bases. Mm -hmm. That's if the content is already in those languages. If you just have your content in a single language that is supported by Q&A Maker, but you want to serve your answers in a variety of languages, that would be integrating another service um, from Microsoft. Uh, is it Text Analytics? Or the Translator? Translator Text. That's what it is. Translator Text. Can you drag your window a little bit to the left? We're... Yeah, I don't. I don't know what's going on there. Um, yes. Yeah, that's good. So translator text is, and, and this is one of the nice things about cognitive services is that all of the services as API endpoints play very nicely together. I could, um, uh, Power Virtual Agent is, is sort of the drag and drop click way of creating a chatbot. But if I had a developer with a little bit of resources and time, I could create a chatbot that, um, with a bot framework that I speak to over my phone. Hey, um, where is the nearest whatever? What are the hours? Whatever customer service -y type question you have, maybe an HR bot or a health bot, I can audibly speak the question. Bot framework 
can use speech services from cognitive services to translate that into text. The text can be sent to Q&A Maker. Q&A Maker's answer can be translated into whatever language it needs to be. If it's in English, but the customer was speaking in Spanish, the answer can be translated into Spanish, sent back to speech, translated into an audible answer and spoken back over their phone. That's incredible. So there's like a whole bunch of different cognitive services offerings that are kind of orchestrated together. So real quick for the audience here. So with Power Virtual Agents, is this kind of like a no code platform? Like you mentioned like the drag and drop ability. And so you don't actually yeah. have to code anything, right? Yeah. If I go back to my Power Virtual Agent, I'm going to Reduce a little. Tell me if you can't see the edge. That looks good. No, no, we can see the edge now. Okay. So, Power Virtual Agent, this, this is the dumbest, cheatiest way to get a bot up so quickly. All I did was set up the fallback topic. So, you can imagine you might have a topic about hours, a topic about products, a topic about um, customer service, what, whatever your topics are that you want to cover, you can create this topic. And if I go into this guy, and all the topics are treated the same way. So you have a name and a description, and this is really for the author to, to manage all of the content. It's not for the user of the chatbot. And then the author can go into this visual flow of this particular topic. So this topic is triggered by any content because it's the only topic that this bot has and I did that on purpose. I'm not saying that's the best way to do it, but that is the five minute get a bot up and running. So my fallback topic takes any text, passes it to this action, and this was all, I just click on the action, like if I wanna add something down here, I can add a question, a condition, I can call an action. So this is calling an action. Show a message, this, which is, this is an example of showing a message. So it's really click, drag, drop, select. There's, I didn't write any code. There's some sense of logic that you do have to know. So if I open this guy, let's see this guy up here. If I want to edit this particular one, this it symbol... Dina, a question for you here. Uh, is it possible to see the code or the logic that's being generated from this design surface? I'm, I ask because I'm thinking of a scenario where you can't maybe quite accomplish what it is you're after with the design surface, but if you had access to the code, you could make a few small tweaks to make it behave the way you want. So that's a really good question. Um, the design surface... Um, for Power Virtual Agent, I don't believe you have access to. Anybody correct me if I'm wrong there. I, I don't think you have access to that, but if you bounce over to the Bot Frameworks Composer, which uses the exact same uh, canvas, it is backed by code. That's awesome. Okay, so I think, the, I think the takeaway for me there is if you have a need for customization, bot framework might be a better choice. Yeah. And what's really interesting about this though is just to put this into perspective for you know developers who might be listening in, um, you can imagine this simple flow right here being backed by like an Azure function that wakes up and uses like a potentially like an SDK for cognitive services and does some action on it and there's string inputs and there's you know error handling and logging and all this infrastructure in place um, but instead of manually programming that up by hand consuming the NuGet packages publishing things getting a CI CD pipeline in place getting um, a user interface you know web app that actually has the chat discoverability and interaction all those bits it's done for you. So you just drag and drop a few things. So it's a much more approachable um, platform, I think, for you know developers who are kind of newer and getting into it that might be afraid to put their hands on the keyboard and start, start just typing up code, right? So it's 
the the line of where Power Virtual Agent meets a uh, bot framework, there's there's definitely some uh, black and white, but there's also some gray. Um, so if we went over and looked at bot framework, they have just done a phenomenal job. I I just can't say enough about the job that they've done in in providing samples and explaining what it is they do. So let me see if I can get you to the right um, right place. Um, where is the bot framework? Uh, so while Dina is looking for that, I think this is where we would start to get into the .NET space. Um, I, I think once you use bot framework, well, then you, you would have a need to use C Sharp uh, with the SDK. Uh, .NET is definitely one of those supported languages, but it's not the only one. So if a customer wanted to be in the um, in the Azure stack but not use C Sharp, that's also an option. Um, so if I want to create a bot, and I, I must say I haven't been through the new stuff yet. I come through it a different way because in the documentation, I'm usually coming through it through the SDK. Um, all right. So if I want to create a new bot, so I am in the Azure portal now. You can, if you're familiar with the Azure portal, you can sort of see the framework around. And so here I'm going to create a a brand new Azure resource, which usually doesn't, sometimes doesn't get you everything you want, but I'm going to create a bot framework. And you're going to see in the flow that it's going to actually allow me to create everything I need to have a, a testable bot at the end of this. So let's, so right here, they have a bot template. I can choose the two languages. I know Python is coming and I know Java is somewhere down the road, but it's also on their thought. So, and then they have the Echo Bot, which is super simple code um, and assumes you have a, you just want to see it working. And then the basic bot uses language understanding, which is one of my services, and bot analytics. And if you select this, and do I have C Sharp? Yes, I have C Sharp. And then everything else here. I do need, um, it's going to create a Lewis, a, a language understanding app for me. So I do need to tell it what my language understanding resource is. And then let's see what else I have. So what this is doing right now is it's creating um, a web app service. It's creating the language understanding app with some um, intents and under, uh, entities. So a language understanding app is used in a bot to figure out what somebody is asking. I want to order um, uh, a pizza with uh, extra cheese. Well, I'm saying that in pretty natural English, but I want uh, that to actually be constructed into a structured format so I, I can pass it off to either a system or a person and they have all the information they need without having to parse through the uh, string itself. So let's see how the bot is doing. And I mean, I just like to add right there that who wouldn't want to order a pizza with extra cheese? Yes. <laughs> So if we go over to the um, preview portal for Lewis. Chicago style deep dish, of course. Oh, yeah, yeah. I really miss eating out. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. <laughs> I didn't think I would, but I do. Um, let's see here. And for anyone watching this, um, Dina will be changing all of her subscription keys and regenerating things so that do not uh, try to scrape those and, and 
thieve them away from the they people trying to seriously disappointed. Right. Um since I'm the admin for the subscription and I get to see all the bills, I'm <laughs> furiously <laughs> deleting things all the time. That's actually, uh, I'm glad you brought that up, David. There's actually a uh, Chrome browser extension. Um, it would work in New Edge as well that will hide that sensitive information in things like the Azure portal. I That's assume cool. it would work here as well. Oh, I love that. We should. How does, uh, how does uh, that work? So it was built by one of our cloud advocates. Um, I'll dig up the name of the extension and post it in chat. So you can see that it's still creating the resources it needs for the bot, but it has already created the um, app behind it. You can see that it was created today. And um, if we go and actually look at it, it looks like it's a travel app to book a flight, get the weather, and then two conversational bits of cancel. And then this is the fallback for this uh, app. Let's see if it's still deploying. So if we look at, and this is um, another service I, I work on. So this is the intent. So a customer might type into the chat bot, book a flight to Berlin on February 14th. This is an example that we, added to the model to help train it to pull out uh, the overall intent of book flight as well as the uh, bits. So it looks like it's already trained. I would imagine it's already published since the bot is trying to do its thing. So if we go try to say, um, cancel my trip to New York City, in two weeks. So it has detected that it was a book flight intent. And then if we inspect, can you guys actually see my screen? Am I was I just falling off no, yeah, you were falling off a little bit. That's, that's okay. better. So um, I typed in cancel my trip to New York City in two weeks. So I'm not, I as the user, as the customer of this bot, I don't, I don't really know how to structure my sentence so that it's, it's picked up. And the user shouldn't have to. They should be able to type in um, anything that they would normally type into any chatbot, a uh, text message, anything like that, any... Uh, uh, um, natural language. Any natural language, but also any abbreviations, any slang, anything like that. And Ooh, you what, add... What about uh, emojis? Um, some of the services handle emojis, um, and some of them don't. So I can't remember where emojis fall on language understanding. I'm going to guess you would have to do some work training the app. Okay. Um, so here we have, we have a pretty low score of 23%, but it is our top prediction. So I would imagine the, the trip up here was the word cancel, because I bet they don't have a lot... They, this particular app hasn't been trained for COVID-19, doesn't know flights are going to be canceled, and that's probably a really unique set of text. So um, I would need to add some more examples of, of people wanting to cancel their flights in order to increase that score. Um, the composite entity of New York was pulled out. And then it did predict that in two weeks was a date time. That's awesome. And so, and it looks pretty rough. I'm sure developers are trying to say, okay, that doesn't look as structured as I would need to be able to use. So let's see if we can look well, while, at while you're pulling that up, just real quick question. So like the intent was book a flight. So would it be ideal to add one that's cancel flight as an intent with some examples of like cancellation or negative um, connotations in the context of like a trip? Okay, that's a really good question. What you're talking about is how should the model manage uh, things that might be related? So mm -hmm. you could have a cancel flight intent, but a lot of the wording would be overlapped. Okay. So you could also have um, a managed flight intent 
And then you have examples of both creating the flight and canceling the flight. And then there would have to be an entity around that word. So this would have to be some sort of an action entity. Um, and I think as I grew the examples, if it was a single intent that did both book and cancel, I think I would have to have a lot of examples in the word pattern that people are using in order to figure out whether I should eventually break it up into two different intents. Um, Interesting. So the, the short answer is you can do either. You can have two separate intents and, and then overlapping entities, or you can have one intent with an additional entity discussing the action or managing the action. Got it. We um, have a uh, question in the chat from LQDev1, and the question is, is it best to have one bot per scenario or use case, or can I build Jeeves? Sort of a, a bot to rule all. <laughs> Jeeves, I love that. <laughs> uh, that's a name I haven't heard in a very long time. I know, ask Jeeves, right? <laughs> so when I think of the answer, you can do either. I think of it as a maintenance issue. Um, so I, from a developer standpoint, how would I manage um, all of that? And then how many people are in the process helping me? So if you have an entire team that's managing the booking of a flight, so you have a data science person or um, a content person managing what these are for just book a flight and what the entities are and the examples and the testing and the development and the production, and there's a single team just to handle this single type of app, chatbot, or intent, it makes sense to keep it in its own app and its own uh, separate domain space away from all of the others. Um, the bot framework and language understanding have a tool called Dispatch that allows you to connect a lot of different language understanding apps with um, uh, specific subject domains into a parent app that can manage the, the dispatching of the work to each one. So I, I think of it in terms of how much maintenance is it to have a single app with different intents, like maybe three, five, ten different intents. We're going to book a flight. We're going to ask for your customer service information, like the email, the phone number, um, all of that kind of thing. Maybe an intent about what's my meal selection choices. Uh, maybe an intent about my seat selection choices. Um, so it's really about the maintenance. Is is the maintenance for all of that centralized and into a single spot, or is it against many different teams? And how do you want to manage it? If it's spread out by that subject domain by team, it makes sense to have a single language understanding app per team and then bubble it all up into a parent app using dispatch to go between the different ones so that the the subject matter experts are are closely related to their single language understanding app. Does that make sense? I think that makes a lot of sense. There was actually another question from LQ Dev One that I want to make sure we get to. It was asked a while ago, and it was getting at uh, you know production scenarios with with agents. Um, how would you monitor an agent in a production environment? Is that possible? Um. Okay, I am definitely not the power virtual agent um, guru. So when I was over looking at, this is me poking around, I'm not an expert. I did notice that there is an analytics page here. And, and remember that when we're talking about power virtual agents, we're talking about it inside of an Office 365 situation. So we're not talking about a power virtual agent, from my understanding, that's available to the entire world. We're talking about power virtual agent being available to everybody in your Office 365 organization. So um, the analytics don't have to cover uh, the world in terms of, of uh, throughput or, or um, content. It just has to manage your Office 365 organization worth of people and throughput. 
but there is there's some analytics that you can look at to manage. Um, beyond that, I haven't done anything with analytics for a power virtual agent. So now I'm curious because I keep thinking about like production scenarios and I think analytics is definitely an important part of that. But when we start thinking about like the infrastructure behind a lot of this in terms of like scalability, is that automatic? Like, do we just get that implicitly for using this platform? Uh, good question. I don't, I don't actually know that answer. Are you referring to agents or the, the bot framework, David? Um, agents. Uh, I'm thinking here like the power virtual agents. I would assume since it's just kind of no code that you get a lot of those things um, just implicitly and it, it comes with it. With the bot framework stuff, I mean, if you're managing the resources yourself and whatnot, that's where I'd imagine um, in, in production scenarios you have to have like an Azure admin who's more you know close to managing the resources and the scalability of them. Right, yeah, that's my understanding. I would think in cases where you need to really scale out beyond what agents provides for you, I think that's a great use case for bot framework. You would just have more control. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, bot framework has... Um, bot framework allows you to programmatically add anything. You know, just... It's, it's basically a, a code connecting various bits and pieces. Um, so this it looks is like awesome. it's... It's finally published. So this is this is the chatbot right here. This is a test window to show you what you would get. So it gives you an example of book a flight from Paris to Berlin. What about book a flight to? Where's I'm not seeing that. It's it's down here. Can you see this? Oh, can you I... can you resize your window on the bottom a little bit? Just pull the bottom up. Ever so slightly. A little bit more. Right there. Perfect. Wow, you guys really can't see much of my screen. Okay, good to know. <laughs> um, so here is, we're still in the Azure portal. The bot has been published. And it immediately drops me into the test in web chat, which is connected to this language understanding app which we've already talked about canceling the trip. Mm -hmm. So if I say I want to book a trip. Book a flight to New York City. What can I help you with today? It does not seem to be uh, super smart right now. Is it anticipating a date, too, or is that just like an extra entity that it would pull out if it was provided? It's uh, a good question. Uh, let's see I, I don't remember how the sample code is written. Um, uh, yes, please confirm. I have you traveling from. So this whole, this and and structuring the answer and giving you more follow up this is all programmatically done for you but you have complete control over it so if you go over to build you can download the code ooh that sounds like fun yeah and and the nice thing is if if you want to actually see the code you can see the code you can open in the online code editor i wouldn't recommend this for a typical use scenario I would this would be the I really need to see what that code looks like right now in this moment and not as a typical part of your development cycle but you can see the code I think this is where we need a do not try this at home disclaimer for this <laughs> well well you can it, it's there on purpose to see the code and maybe to make a one-off bug fix it's not there to be your complete IDE for your development. Um, well, I can tell you that as a you know former developer uh, in in enterprise 100 companies, that this has been a, a huge um, godsend, so to speak. Like the app service editor that you're in right now. Like when this was introduced into the Azure portal, I loved it because there was 
and it's you know it's not something that you like sharing or bragging about but there has been countless times where you roll out you go through your ci cd you test everything it looks good but once it's in production oh my gosh there's a line of html that needs to be hand edited or a line yeah. of javascript and it's like oh my gosh you can go change that and it's it's awesome Yes, if you need an immediate fix without going through your pipeline again, mm-hmm. it's that critical. This is this is absolutely awesome. Um, if you look at it, you can see that it ha- it it is a .NET build. It has the bin. Um, it has the object directory. It has um, the C sharp files. Yeah, it has C sharp file. This is the actual JSON for the app for the language understanding app. There's nothing being hidden from you or taken away from you. The dialogues in here, the booking a flight, cancel and help, those resolve to the actual intents in Lewis. So you can immediately see that. Um, you should be able to see. They do. They they are constantly improving the uh, SDK and interoperability of uh, Bot Framework to Lewis. So I haven't looked at the latest bits of code, but you can see that here's the string being returned to the customer that is is using the information returned from Bot Framework. And then let's see what else is there. Anything else interesting here? I would be interested in seeing that uh, csproj file, the uh, corebot.csproj. It's in the the root of the directory, I think. Uh, I just want to address this real quick. There was um, uh, one of our guests asked what this stream is actually about. So thank you for asking that. Today we've got Dina Barry on, and she's with Cognitive Services. Um, All of us are content developers uh, working on the docs.microsoft.com platform, creating various content. Um, And in this, we we try to help enable external um, contributions. But in addition to that, we'll deep dive into code and quick starts and examples. And um, today we're looking at Q&A Maker and Bot Framework and Power Platform Visual um, Agents and Virtual Agents and all all sorts of amazing things. So thank you for asking that question. Okay, so I downloaded the code and and you can you can see that it's it's pretty much what you're seeing here. They're not hiding anything. It's the exact same code, okay, except it hasn't been built. So, you know, the bin and obj files aren't there. That's amazing. So, then if we open up here, there's the solution file. That's what you expect to see. I see we've got a project file. So it's everything that a .NET developer would expect to see to, to open this up in Visual Studio and tinker around with it. Yeah. That's amazing. And they've they've... They've tried to make this very first project where you're it's you chose the the basic bot and they added the code for you. And they're trying to give you enough of a taste of what it is to make that conversational through flow through the bot and connect you um, a third party service and get the information back and process it and show it to the user. So you sort of have an idea of what is going on. You have that taste of success, but you don't necessarily have to be an expert to make it work right off the bat or to make a change to the conversational flow. And they're not hiding anything or taking it away from you. So if we look at the core bot, it's it's pretty much what we were looking at before. Here's our, can you guys even see this? Can you pull the window up to the left kind of over where your browser is right now and roughly the same size? Oh, that's so sad. That I know. It's not behaving. Okay. So it's it's the exact same thing. It's there's no code being hidden from you. It's exactly what a .NET developer would expect to see. There's nothing there's the okay. project file. Let's see what's in that guy. Catastrophic error. Oh, that's a fun one. I don't I don't think I've ever seen that one before. We'll just open up a C sharp file maybe, like the booking dialogue. 
Uh, the interesting thing to me there is that you can actually see the CS proj file listed in Solution Explorer. Yeah, I shouldn't be able to well, well, open with, the Solution file. With COVID-19, I'm not surprised by anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay. fair, fair point. <laughs> okay. So, um, all of the code is here. So if I wanted to run the code, I would need a couple of things. Um, let's make sure. So one of the things I need is the connection information to the language understanding app. So that would be the Azure um, authoring endpoint and key um, to the runtime, not the authoring environment, but the runtime. So let's see if that's actually anywhere. I can't remember where it gets set. Let's see. There's my app ID. There's my key. There's Can you my... zoom in on the uh, inside the IDE itself? Uh, I think not if you much just... of a Visual Studio. Yeah, mouse. Yeah, control mouse wheel up. There you go. Okay. Thanks. Oh, so it already actually has the key. So when you download that, that's pretty interesting. So yeah, you're... one of the questions the download asks you. Um, okay. Do you want do you want this information brought down with you? Um, and I always say yes because I immediately want to be able to use it. Um, so the next thing I need to to be able to develop this locally to make any changes locally is to get the emulator. And the really cool thing about that framework is it's all open source. You can see the development happening in real time. I mean. Theoretically, you know, with PRs and issues and whatnot. And then, where's the download button? Oh, here it is. This, I think this is the one I want. And you can see they're, they're constantly working on it. Um, another nice thing about Bot Framework is all of the samples. I really wanted to show you guys all the samples. So let's see if I can figure out how to get to that. I know we're getting low on time too, so I just wanted to make sure we covered all the things that you wanted to touch on. Um, yeah, I think that might be. Uh, let's see here. Okay. Oh, they do have Python and they do have Java in the bot framework. And then where are all their samples? I think they had a link to the samples up there in that table you were looking at before. The column on the left towards the bottom, it said samples. Up a little bit higher. Uh, right there, samples. Okay. .NET Core Web API. So they're trying to keep all of the samples one-to-one. Uh, -one. So if it's in .NET, it's in JavaScript, it'll eventually be in Python, it'll eventually be in um, Java. So then all of this sample is already written for you. Any, well, not any, but most of the things you might want to figure out. Here's a Q&A sample. There's a dispatch sample that works with Lewis and Q&A Maker. Um, here's a multilingual bot. And I think this is amazing that you're calling attention to the samples. I don't think they get enough credit. Like being that it's open source, you know, in GitHub, anyone can go look at it. We're literally enabling and empowering developers around the globe to use like this code as an example. And it's it's so powerful. And like I said, I, I just feel like this stuff is always understated, and I just love the fact that you're calling attention to it because there are a ton of samples here that are very, very comprehensive. And the, the, you know, Microsoft is a huge company. Everybody's working on samples, but sometimes samples aren't always maintained or a person moves on. But the Bot Framework team, you can tell that they are actively maintaining yes. their code, working on it, answering issues, taking PRs. They're not... Right. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah, two two hours ago is what she's calling attention to there. In, in addition to that, I saw when you were scrolling through that before that there was uh, a pull request where the comment was updating to .NET Core 3.1, which as everyone should be aware of, um, that's the latest um, 
long-term support version, right, Scott? That's correct. We've got 2.1 and 3.1. Those are the LTS versions for .NET Core. Um, use either one of those, and you'll be supported for uh, the foreseeable future. Awesome. Great. Um, yeah, I think we're getting close to our time here, so... This has been awesome. I've I've learned a lot, and I think the irony is that um, Dina and I actually work on the same team, so it's it's pretty neat to see like deeper into all the things that you're working on. Um, they're truly an inspiration and a, a bit of background, just the context set here. I've been with Microsoft now for like nine months, and when I joined, Dina was actually my hiring buddy. So. Microsoft um, has like this kind of little mentor mentee process where when you're hired on, um, they they pick someone obviously that's on the team that will kind of help bring you up to speed. So I just wanted to give Dina a shout out and say thank you for that. It's been a great experience, um, and thank you for joining us today on this episode. And it's been super mm-hmm. fun. Any other final words, Scott and Dina? No, I I would echo what you said. I learned way more than I thought I would. I, you know, I, I knew a little bit about bot framework, um, wasn't at all aware of the agent offering. So uh, we'll definitely be playing around with that. Yeah. And I, I'm excited to learn more about like some of the power app stuff, like the no code, like dragging and dropping and really diving into that. Cause I didn't think it was that easy to tie in with some of the cognitive services. And now that I know that, oh, it's going to be really cool. Yeah. yeah, this was great. We appreciate it, Dina. Well, thanks for having me today, guys. This was really fun. Awesome. Thank cool. you. Cool. Well, be sure to follow Dina at DFBerry on Twitter, and we look forward to uh, our next episode. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>